The year is 1603. Elizabeth I has just died, and London has the plague. Public gatherings have been banned, theaters have all been closed, and anyone that worked for them is out of a job. So what is an ambitious young writer-actor going to do? Oh, I know. You could make irrelevant YouTube videos in an oversaturated market. Sure, that's great if you're an idiot like me. But you're not. You're William Shakespeare, and you're a genius. And so when you're out of work, you write sonnets. Sometime around the year 1600, William Shakespeare wrote 154 sonnets that would comprise some of his best and most unusual work, and would offer us some of the most beautiful and poignant poetry in the English language. I'm Sam, and this is The Unweeded Garden. So, why Shakespeare? Why poetry? Well, if you ask me, it's because poetry helps make it easier to be a person. The world is wonderful, but it can often be confusing and hostile and lonesome. And making any kind of sense of life and how we feel in it can be difficult. Especially when things get a bit... awful. And although no one really has any answers when it comes to being a person, there is some comfort in being seen. Knowing that what you're going through someone else has gone through. And that's what makes Shakespeare great. Because every emotion or experience, he seems to have been through it. And with the sonnets, we don't see a person who's cool and collected and who's got everything figured out. We see a strange, passionate, but confused individual who is burning with all the same desires and fears that every one of us has. And when he writes it, and we read it, we're with him. And everybody thinks he's so great, so... Must be pretty good. In order to explore Shakespeare's sonnets, we need to ask, well, what is a sonnet? So, a sonnet is a poem. Specifically, it's a 14-line poem. And usually it's a 14-line love poem. They were originally popularized by the Italian poet Petrarch, who was writing them to his beloved Laura. But they were made extremely popular in England by one of those soldier-scholar-poet types from the Elizabethan era, Sir Philip Sidney. A sonnet has a pretty standard format. It's usually broken up into four sections. The first three sections have four lines each, and then it's followed by a section with only two lines each called a couplet. And it rhymes, because, you know, it's an old-timey poem. It's unclear why exactly Shakespeare wrote the sonnets, but knowing Shakespeare was probably because he wanted money. And he knew how popular the sonnet form was. But as with everything Shakespeare did, it was never just a meal ticket. Shakespeare's sonnets had a very similar structure, because he was an artist who liked to steal. He wrote 154 sonnets, which was 1,846 lines. Now, just to give you a bit of reference, most of his plays are about 25 to 3,500 lines. The collection of sonnets that we have now was published in 1609, but they were definitely written before that. Some of them were written as early as 1593, and the structure is much like those that came before. It was broken up into four sections. The first three had four lines, and the couplet had two lines. Each stanza tended to rhyme with itself. Like in this one, where shines rhymes with declines, and dimmed rhymes with untrimmed. And they were written in iambic pentameter, which was the heartbeat of Elizabethan poetry. Iambic pentameter basically means that the line went, da dum da dum da dum da dum da dum When I consider everything that grows, when I do count the clock that tells the time, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Almost all of Shakespeare's writing had this meter to it, and it gives it this fantastic sense of rhythm and this amazing flow. It flows to be or not to be, that is the question. <laughs> and so, Shakespeare took his place among the great sonneteers of history. Oh no wait, he completely mastered the form and relegated everyone else to obscurity. I mean, I know, it's not a competition. But if it was, Shakespeare would have won. Right, because Petrarch is so great. I mean, sure, we've all heard of Petrarch, but when's the last time you actually read one of his dumbass- What makes Shakespeare's sonnets so fantastic is how heartfelt and human they are. And he was kind of the perfect guy to be writing in this really heightened style. Everyone tends to think of Shakespeare as being very fancy, but in his soul, he was still some kid from the country with a heart that was way too big for its own good. In fact, tons of characters in his plays, they mercilessly make fun of all of the overblown, fancy-schmancy, ridiculous poetry. Your name is like a bell that hangs in my heart. 
And if one of his characters starts writing poems, it usually means that he's gone stupid. So when Shakespeare took to writing sonnets, he set out to do it different. For one thing, his predecessors, like Petrarch, they wrote about this perfect, divine, unachievable love. Petrarch wrote about his beloved Laura, even though he only ever met her once, which is... interesting. Shakespeare hated this phony, overblown worship. I mean, look, he's basically turned his wannabe girlfriend into an angel, giving him top prize at the poetry competition. Although, to be fair, I guess Italian poets were kind of obsessed with being obsessed with girls that they barely ever met. Shakespeare deliberately turned this conceit on its head. Instead of some heavenly, angelic goddess, the sonnets are mostly written to a playboying, overly horny, rich young man, and a lady of questionable aesthetic with bad breath, both of whom drove the poet crazy. Were these people that Shakespeare actually knew? Well, no one can say. But it is clear that Shakespeare was trying to show us that the course of true love never did run smooth. That love, real love, has this weird tendency to be a bit of a dumpster fire, and can be just as painful and messy as it is wonderful and worth it. There are a few consistent characters in the sonnets, and since Shakespeare was a playwright, there's even something of a narrative or a story to them. In this series, I'm hoping to explore that story and help us find out what makes these poems so great. In the sonnets, there are four main characters. The poet, who may have been Shakespeare writing autobiographically, or it may have just been a character of a poet, but probably not. The vast majority of poems are written to a character known as the Fair Youth, who is probably a young, impetuous nobleman and who is apparently pretty hot. No, 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 I mean like hot. No, like, like really hot. Perfect. Then you also have the rival poet, who the fair youth occasionally likes better, and it drives the poet insane. And finally, the mysterious character known as the Dark Lady. She's described using a lot of images of darkness and blackness, so some scholars have theorized that the real person may have been of African descent, but nobody's sure about any of this. The sonnets go through something of a story, with various sequences on themes or on actions that happen between the characters. The first 126 largely feature the young man, with some of the rival poet popping in, whereas the last 30 or so focus more on the dark lady, and almost all of the poems speak about the difficulty and the beauty involved in these relationships. But the sonnets aren't just great because Shakespeare was super passionate. He was an incredibly intelligent writer, and he knew how to use classical rhetoric to his advantage. Check out how he uses devices like anaphora, which is basically repeating the same word over and over. He does it in Sonnet 66, the suicide sonnet, by hammering the start of every line with the word and, 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 like an anvil on your brain. Or in Sonnet 135, where he keeps using the word will, making a pun with his own name. Shakespeare also uses a ton of antithesis, which is contrasting images or ideas, like how he contrasts the work of the mind with body's work, and further reinforces it with contrasting night and day. And he plays with sound, too, like by using alliteration, using words that all start with the same sound. Like here in Sonnet 9, where he says, The world will wail thee like a makeless wife. The world will be thy widow and still weep. Or in Sonnet 12, where we hear, Born on the beer with white and bristly beard. The first one, it seems to wail and whine, and the second one, it bounces along on all those B sounds. And he continues to mess around and play with sounds in this next sonnet, Sonnet 30, where he describes what it's like to be apart from the person that he loves, with nothing to do but to think and overthink all of the sadness from his past. When to the sessions of sweet, silent thought, I summon up remembrance of things past. I sigh the lack of many a thing I sought, and with old woe, new wail my dear time's waste. Then can I drown an eye, unused to flow, for precious friends hid in death's dateless night, and weep afresh love's long since cancelled woe, and moan the expense of many a vanished sight. Then can I grieve at grievances foregone, and heavily from woe to woe tell o'er the sad account of four bemoaned moan, which I knew pay, as if not paid before. But if the while I think on thee, dear friend, all losses are restored, and sorrows end. Sonnet 30 dives into a ton of themes that run all throughout the poems. Absence, 
the passage of time, loneliness, self-doubt, and finding solace in the ones that you love. And we hear in phrases like grieve at grievances, woe to woe, for bemoan and moan, how Shakespeare is elongating all of those pains and creating a whirlpool of sound to show how he's drowning in his own self-pity. His themes aren't just those of courtly love and chivalric acts. He plunges straight into all kinds of real human experiences. There are sonnets about jealousy, about suicide, about despair, but also sonnets where he's shouting for joy or making jokes about horses or the church, or even totally unexpected sonnets about hermaphroditism or procreation. But more than anything, the sonnets are about love. For Shakespeare, that's what everything always finally came down to. And it is not a love that is always easy. For him, real love was complicated, fanatical, and occasionally very messy. But for him, it was constant fuel, the summer's day that kept him searching and living and writing. I hope you enjoyed this video, and with any luck, I will soon figure out how to do them properly so that I can provide at least a decent tour through these incredible works.